before I get to this next diagram I want to use the board for, I do want to share this. Uh, This is this is really a revelation. Now, <laughs> uh, just 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 um, bear with me here. Um, you know, I've been trying to figure out how how does this work. I mean, I have seen unbelievable transformations in people's lives w with this information. And starting with my wife, she's she's got the best testimony there is. If you haven't heard it, um, we, she gave it at the outset. But you ought to talk to Judy. But um, I've, I've, try, I've been trying to figure out uh, this all my career. In fact, when I was a third year medical student, it's the first time that I um, really began to wonder why some people die, why some people live, um, given equal amount of disease. Uh, when I had uh, patients in the ICU with septic shock and heart attacks and pulmonary emboli, blood clots in the lungs, why some people lived and why some people died. and. Uh, how do people get over chronic illness? And, and how to attack chronic illness and disease? I mean, I can't tell you. I mean, I've made my own self sick over uh, 35 years of trying to help people get better. And I've wanted to, them to get better so bad that I've taken on their illness. And, and it made me sick. Um, and, and my patients, all they've, they've told me this for years. <laughs> Uh, so it's not something I'm saying uh, on my own, uh, but I, but I, I know I know now how this how this stuff works that we're talking about here, and you know this stuff is that I'm talking about. A lot of this stuff is rejected by mainline medicine, so I haven't had an open ear there. I mean, it's a dead end street, and it's also not open by most preachers. I've got a dead end street there, and he, and here here I here I am with with truthful information from from two camps that have never been integrated, and, and I am, God has shown me a way to integrate this truth and these in, this information to literally transform people's lives, and uh, the mainline institutions don't listen to it. So I can't tell you how much I appreciate you uh, listening. <laughs> yeah, you, you'll, be, you'll be blessed, you, you will. So I, I, I wanna thank you very much. I, I, wanna, I wanna tell you how this works. I read this quote a long time ago, and it was one of those things, I mean, when, when I read this quote, I heard God whisper in my ear, don't ever forget it. And the quote is from Viktor Frankl, uh, from his book, Man's Search for Meaning. Now here's a guy who saw thousands of people killed, and thousands of people survive. And he was asking himself the same question, why do some people live and some people survive? Why do some people live and some people die? And here's the, here's the sentence that, that just captivated my heart and mind. Those who have a why to live, listen, those who have a why to live can endure any how. Now when I read that, I, I could have been struck by lightning and had the same reaction to this. I mean, I, I knew this was profound, and I'm not really <laughs> profound. <laughs> That's why I knew it was profound. <laughs> Because uh, this, this isn't me. I mean, this really hit me. I, I, I heard God speak to me. Those who have a why to live can endure any how. Now, in this case, the why is the spiritual and physical understanding of life. That's where the why comes from. The spiritual and the physical. Now, there are a lot of you in here that are, that are going to Bible school. Bible training, um, and you're getting that, that information is essential information for this to work. And that's why I'm here. Essential information for it to work. That information is speaking to your spirit. What I want to, what I want to show you, um, because we're talking about the, 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 um, the brain being the filter, and how we have to, the essential importance of allowing the information to get up to the highest level in our brain, because, you know, I said before, you are not your brain, and the brain lies to you. Do you believe that? <laughs> and I want to show you a brief, uh, a brief clip to uh, illustrate that.
So while the computer's coming up, what I want to do, I want to set up this next diagram here. And here's a, uh, balance is negative, it's Satan's side of the balance in terms of its battle for command and control of our, of our brain and our body. And the fulcrum on this balance is, is, is the anterior cingulate and the insula, two areas that I mentioned earlier. These areas, the information comes in from the outside in before it gets up to this, here's the prefrontal cortex up here. Before it gets up to the front part of the brain, it comes through the limbic system and the brain stem down here. And now we know, just recently, as a matter of fact, that this, these two areas integrate information before it gets to the prefrontal cortex. This area puts the flavoring and the shading on the coloration of what comes out of our emotional center of the brain. It's how we modulate our emotions. Because as I said, emotions are always the, the great downfall to mankind. So what happens here is that this fulcrum can move in either direction. And if this fulcrum is moved down toward, toward this direction here, well, Sorry. <laughs> if, um, if, we put, if we put emphasis and weight on what comes into, that infor into this information center from God, then this part of the, this, this part of the fulcrum goes up. And when, you, when it goes up, that's good. <laughs> you, you want it to go up. And, and what we would like to have happen in our lives is that information comes into our interior cingulate and into the insula, and it's already flavored before it gets up to the prefrontal cortex, so it's the prefrontal cortex in making its decisions through its thoughts and understanding, it favors that of the will of God. And when that happens, what, what happens is that the balance then goes up, and that's, that's good. It goes heavenward. If, on the other hand, the anterior cingulate is operated under anger and resentment and hostility, then that's going to favor Satan and then his flavoring on those potential thoughts and understandings take the precedence and we begin to have a downfall because Satan takes us over. Here's this clip. I wonder if you'd just turn the lights down for me. This picture, focus right there. Now, when you when you put your focus of attention on there, do you begin to see a green ball moving around in a circle? And if you keep your focus of attention there, the pink dots will begin to fade, or they will turn green, one or the other. So if when your focus of attention is on the center of that pain and your eyes are reading the environment and telling you that number one, there's a moving ball, number two, that moving ball is green, and number three, that those pink dots begin to fade away or turn green. It tells you those three things when you're focusing on the center of that picture. Does everybody see a little bit of that? Okay, well, none of those three things are true. <laughs> Put your focus of attention on the circle. Do you see any green balls? No. Does it look like anything is moving or is it just blinking? Okay, so there's no green ball, there's no blinking, the pink dots aren't going away, and they're not turning green. So all of that image are bull-faced lies. That, that's how as intricate as this brain is, the brain will only do what you direct it to do. When you're looking at the center of that, you're, I can go into the physiology of this, but it's, it's too long. <laughs> but when you're, when you're, it's, it's a survival mechanism. God has made this brain and, and eye combination and connection so that if something is moving, if we put our focus of attention, our brain 
doesn't pay any attention to what's in the periphery. It just, it just focuses its attention on what is in the forefront of our vision. And, and when we're in the forefront, when we're focusing on that, on that X, we, can, we focus our attention on that, our peripheral vision begins to lie to us because that's not the most sophisticated part of our vision. The most sophisticated part of our vision, back on the circle, it tells us exactly what's going on. All the balls are pink, there's no green, there's nothing moving, it's just blinking, and we see it for what it is. But our lives do the same thing to us. So it's fully capable that our brains are, at times, giving us false information. Okay, you can turn the lights back on again. On what the issue is in terms of our understanding, evaluation, and assessment, our focus will tell us the exact what's going on. It, it, won't, it won't lie to us. So again, I just wanted to mention, since I lost my caro syrup, I, I lost the ability to demonstrate the importance of attention. But I hope that demonstrates how valuable attention is. That you have to, what you attend to is what uh, your brain is going to tell you. So very important to attend to those things of God. So here's this anterior cingulate. Now, all studies show that uh, as little as 12, they took experimental subjects, prayers, trained prayers, Christian prayers, prayers, people that prayed, and they had them praying over a period of six months' time, and they did their functional MRI scans, and by just 12 minutes of meaningful, prayerful, activity, they literally increase the size of the anterior cingulate in their brain. So this area got bigger and bigger as a person became closer and closer to God. Now the insula, the same thing happened at the insula. The insula is the part of the brain that moderates information, integrates information between the lower, the midbrain and the lower brain before it gets to the prefrontal cortex. And this is that part of the brain where there's an a exact replication of every physical element of the human body. I mean, there's a, there's a literal representation of the human body. There's an area of the insula that controls the kidneys. There's an area of the insula that's connected to the heart. There's an area of the insula connected to the body or brain. There's an area of the insula connected to your back. There's an area of the insula connected to your lungs. And emotional traumatized lesions in these areas of the brain correspond to those organs being involved in the emotional trauma. It's an amazing amount of information, uh, pre previously totally unknown to mankind. You know, going back to our earlier lessons, Descartes, Newton, all the original guys said, well, there's absolutely no connection between the emotions and the body. Emotions are totally superfluous. They have nothing to do with anything. And now we have physical evidence today on, on functional MRI scans that not only is that wrong, but we can actually show what area of the insula is involved. Now, I told you about that wonderful friend of Judy and I that we had uh, over a period of the last 35 years, um, a Christian brother that died of an uh, unusual form of liver cancer, and that totally coincided with a tremendously uh, insulting, humiliating, shameful, guilt-ridden um, family issue that, that his family went through. And almost two years to the day after the inception of that whole process, he develops liver cancer, healthy as a horse, not a stitch of um, health problem before that time. And, and I know if we'd had the capability at the time, we probably could have done a scan of his insula, and the area of the insula that controls the liver probably had an insult in it, so that the control and information from this area of the brain down to the liver became disrupted, so the disease occurred in the liver. So if the disease occurs down here, do we focus on this area to solve the problem? Heck no. We have to go back up here to solve the problem, and this is the area of the insula that's under the command and control uh, of our emotional center. So this is, this is the origin of the, of the disease. Of course, you know, the 95% of, of medicine, I had to face this reality myself, 95% of my medical practice, I spent time writing prescriptions and doing operations to treat symptoms of diseases, never even coming to the source of the problem. But that's the way our world is screwed up. So, if the insula has this great integrative potential, that's where chronic pain, that's where all these physical things become integrated with our emotions, is in, is in the insula. 
And the insula is also susceptible to uh, our ideas and our beliefs about God. Uh, they've done uh, functional scans on people who believed in either an authoritarian God, in other words, a mean God, versus the same kind of scans on people's belief system that was based on a good and loving God. And do you know that it, that, that has a, has, shows up as a difference on the size of not only the anterior cingulate, but also the insula in the brains? So if you're walking around thinking that we have a, a benevolent, good, loving God, you're going to grow your insular area, you're going to grow your anterior cingulate, therefore you're going to grow your ability to express God's will through your life, through your prefrontal cortex, and that's what's going to consume the majority of your thoughts and attention. If you're walking around thinking that we're under the guise of an authoritarian God, like, like I lived the majority of my life, and I know my coronary disease is directly related to living under the belief that we had an authoritarian God that every time I made a mistake, he was thumping me on the head with a gavel. I, I know that as well as I'm standing here. Um, not that I didn't leave a, st a stressful life with what I was doing and everything, but I, that stuff I walked through just like I walk over that spilt carol syrup. I don't think I missed a word in my talk because I spilt the carol syrup because I'm used to walking through an emergency room people dying and bleeding to death all over the place and you can't lose your cool <laughs> under those kind of situations. But I lost my cool internally when I had the concept that I had an authoritarian God that didn't like me. That's what kills people and dang near kill me. So th this, this, ho this whole uh, uh, area is there for us to take advantage of. Now, so this, I'm, I've been talking so far all about what we do inside our brain and in our body. Now, this is also amenable to changes from the outside. And this is what I mentioned last time. Remember last time I said, come back next week because I'm going to tell you about mirror neurons. Mirror neurons are it's the newest, one of the newest discoveries in neuroscience. And mirror means just like you're looking at your face in a mirror. This was discovered by an Italian uh, group of neuroscientists uh, about eight years ago. They discovered that we have neurons in our brain that mirror what someone else is thinking and doing. That means that if you're sitting in a chair and you're watching, the, the, actual, the actual discovery came, <laughs> when the experimental subjects were watching another subject eating peanuts. Now these experimental subjects, they all had electroencephalograms hooked up to their brain because they were doing an entirely different kind of experiment, they, but they were, doing, they were studying EEG reports, electroencephalogram, brainwave reports. So they had, they had the experimental subject sitting here eating peanuts. And they had everybody, all the experimental subjects, and there were six experimental subjects, and then they had the, the person that was sitting in the chair eating peanuts. And they looked at the, they were watching on an oscilloscope the brainwave changes. And as this person was eating peanuts, they began to look at the screens on the other people's brain EEGs, and all of them began to look just like the person they were watching eat peanuts. So the, if, you're, if you're doing, if you're exposed to someone, watching someone, putting your focus of attention on someone outside of yourself, and that person is doing a meaningful act, that will begin to fire the same neurons in your brain that's being fired in this person's brain. I began to look into this kind of stuff because I was wondering about why God and how God meant to teach us through the life of Jesus. And you think about the teaching of Jesus. I talked a couple times ago about, you know, Jesus heard from the Father, he saw the Father, he had Old Testament scriptures, so there was writing involved in Jesus' knowledge of, of the Father and, and of uh, the, the spirit world. So he, he was speaking, he was being spoken to by God through that sensation. Well, then I began to wonder, well, how did, how did God impart that uh, process to us as human beings? So why did Jesus pick 12 men? You know, Jesus spoke to them. And those guys had the same scriptures to read that, that Jesus had to read. But more important than anything, they walked and they talked and they did the same things that Jesus was doing. See one, do one, and teach one. That's the dictum we had in medical school. See a spinal tap, do a spinal tap, and teach a spinal tap. Jesus used, the, he was the originator. This whole field of study right now is called interpersonal neurobiology. 
There's a whole bunch of information on, on the effect that we have, and there's a tremendous amount of in, investigative efforts on how this affects us as we're growing up, because who are the first people we see doing things? It's our parents. So we begin to model our brain without them even saying a word to us, or without us even s seeing uh, anything other than them going through their actions of daily living. That's what presents the greatest image to us. You know, I think God uh, um, takes us through our life's experiences for specific reasons. And uh, I went through a season of being a rattlesnake hunter. <laughs> When, when Judy and I lived, lived in Texas, I, uh, I got uh, uh, interested in, in, in wanting to learn more about snakes. Number one, I was treating rattlesnake bites, so I needed, I needed to have that information. But on top of that, from a spiritual standpoint, I, didn't, I never really paid much attention to snakes. Um, so I didn't pay much attention to uh, the uh, serpent that God used to demonstrate Satan. So I started thinking about snakes, and I started hunting snakes. And I began to realize that uh, uh, God had me out there hunting rattlesnakes for a specific reason. And uh, as I was watching these uh, rattlesnakes as I hunted them, um, we had a record one day, uh, a church group uh, that I was involved with uh, would go out and hunt these rattlesnakes and then would sell them at these rattlesnake roundups for uh, support for different things that we would contribute to. We got 174 rattlesnakes out of, out of one den one Sunday afternoon. <laughs> That's filling two galvanized garbage cans all the way to the top with rattlesnakes. <laughs> the first day I went rattlesnake hunting, I brought home a five-gallon bucket of rattlesnakes. And uh, they, were, they were alive, but I didn't want them to be alive, and I didn't want to take them out one by one and kill them because I didn't want to get bit. So I took, I, we had a drop-in freezer, so I pushed everything in the freezer to the side and just took the whole five-gallon bucket and put it in the freezer. Only thing is, I forgot to tell Judy that I put those rattlesnakes in the freezer. <laughs> <laughs> So she goes, out, she goes out the next day to take some meat out of the freezer to thaw it out for supper, and she opens the freezer, and here's these five gallons of rattlesnake looking right at, looking her in the eye. Of course, they were dead, but she didn't know they were dead. She was afraid they were going to come back to life again once I took them out of the freezer. <laughs> So anyway, I, I, was, I was in the process of trying to understand uh, Satan. I was, trying to, I, was trying to, I was doing a, st a study myself, trying to understand all this stuff and, and really see how, how devious Satan is and uh, wondering why God chose a serpent. So in washing these rattlesnakes, it was you know, extremely uh, instructive. I just want to share this with you. Um, <laughs> whether you want to see it or not. <laughs> okay, so, um, anybody ever rattlesnake hunted? <laughs> okay, well, the important thing here, um, God was speaking to me. He wanted me to understand the, the, uh, the, the vileness of, of the serpent, the vileness of Satan, and how sin works in the human body. That's what I was asking God for. As a medical doctor, I wanted to know, how does sin work in the human body? So I could think, well, okay, so what is sin? Well, I, I started studying the biochemistry of rattlesnake venom. In fact, I was communicating with a guy here at the University of Colorado at the time was the nation's leading expert on the biochemistry of rattlesnake venom. And at that time, there were 56 identified enzymes that were in rattlesnakes venom. And believe me, I treated a, a number of rattlesnake bites and saw individuals uh, come within a whisper of losing extremities and life and everything else. The vileness of this venom is literally unbelievable, but seeing it in a human is not, is not as instructive as seeing it in nature, because in a human, you're trying to cut the venom out, you're trying to give antivenom, you're doing all these things to treat all this stuff, doing fasciotomies and incisions and everything to reduce the pressure and trying to salvage a limb. But the important thing I want to illustrate here is what effect sin has on a living organism. What effect sin has on a living organism? So here's a little mouse. Now, as time went on, I actually turned my garage into a herpetarium. I think I had 30 rattlesnakes in cages like this, and I had 200 white mice in my garage, and my wife is still married to me, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> so so here's this, watch, watch this interchange here. Here's simple old humanity in the form of the white mouse. 
checking the environment out. Mouse kind of cleans up. Well, he didn't. He's he's doing just fine. Well, there's nothing wrong with serpents. Sin's not going to hurt me. And he goes on about his he goes on about his life. This is this is the way sin operates in the human body. But what's happened to this mouse is this mouse has been impregnated with venom. So what is that venom doing? Those 56 enzymes right now are metabolizing that mouse from the inside out. That mouse is literally being broken down. You know all the digestive enzymes that we have in our stomach and in our small intestine and in our body that breaks all of our food down, all those digestive enzymes? Well, guess what? Snakes don't have them. It's contained in their venom. So when they bite an animal, they inject that digestive venom into the organism, into the mouse. Now that mouse is literally dissolving on the inside because of the biochemical effect of that venom, that sin has entered into their body and it's literally destroying every organ in that mouse's body right now as we're watching it skip around there. And what happens when a mouse finally dies, see the rattlesnake won't pay attention to it. You watch, he won't go back and bite the mouse again. He knows he's got him. It's just like Satan with us. He gets us to trip up and gets us to follow up and you know, he knows he's got us. He goes on and crawls off and waits for the mouse to die. The mouse being you and I. When we die, he comes back and swallows us without having to exert any energy to metabolize us because we're already being metabolized by the sin he injected into us. And we're no, we're no more knowledgeable of it. We're dead and gone. And that's, that's, the way, that's the way Satan works and that's what God wants to protect us from. So you can see the snake isn't over there trying to bite the mouse. Now the mouse has finally, finally succumbed to the venom. He's taking his last breath. There's, a, there's neurotoxins that, that paralyze the nervous system. There's hemotoxins that completely dissolve the human blood. There's the toxins that cause renal kidney failure, cause uh, liver failure, cause respiratory arrest. Every single organ system is affected by this sin that's been injected in a mouse. But you didn't see any difference in the mouse, did you? He didn't have any blood on him. He didn't look like he'd been injured. But it was all going on on the inside, just like what happens uh, to us uh, when we get overtaken by the great deceiver who's out to steal, kill, and destroy from us. But once the rattlesnake realizes the mouse is dead, I mean, he's just gonna, he's gonna drag him off and he's gonna reposition his bite and go for his nose and he's going to swallow him and then his, those digestive enzymes have already been activated in the mouse and he'll completely digest the mouse and the, the snake, the serpent, will go on to live another day. The poor mouse has been had. And I would like to protect every one of us from that consequence which is out there in the form of the adversary and the uh, great deceiver who's out there trying to kill us. We just have to, through understanding, take command and control of him and, and uh, remove the uh, blinders off of our eyes in order to do that. So hopefully this, this series of information has uh, done that to a certain extent, and I, I hope this, this last little <laughs> demonstration here will be, will be uh, uh, evidence of how sin works in our life, and when sin is tempting or when sin, the image of that mouse uh, going down and dying and being auto-digested from the inside out by this venom comes to mind because that's exactly the way Satan does it to you and I. That's the way he did it to Adam and Eve. That's why uh, God said, well, death enters the world with that, with that sin. Well, that, that just thinking thoughts of sin do the exact same thing as actually are committing the sin. And what it does, it begins to produce these digestive enzymes, these stress hormones and stress chemicals in the human body that literally begin to digest our body and make us sick. That's, that's what causes disease. Okay, well, I want to thank everybody for your uh, attentiveness and your uh, words of encouragement. And Judy and I both would uh, love to, to uh, continue this, uh, but apparently we've run to the end of our semester. We plan to, uh, to work on this over the summer and kind of retool some things and uh, come back and continue this. I'd like to continue to teach this parallel with the uh, college course because without the foundation of faith, uh, and without the curriculum at that college, this information is great information, but it's not going to be life-changing. 
you know, I'm here to tell you, this is great medical information, but I, I've, I've given this without the foundation of knowledge, and it, and it doesn't work. That, that, that's why I'm here. I want to see it work. So let me just close with a word of prayer then. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for being here with us tonight, Lord. And uh, I just ask your protection and your covering over each and every one here. Uh, thank you for imparting knowledge through our hearts and our minds uh, about the absolute truth, Lord. Uh, I ask that you uh, bless and uh, bring glory to, to your son through our lives. Give us the, the full uh, capability and, and the full um, manifestation of his life in us. Continue to bring us uh, to that remembrance and the remembrance of our identity in Christ uh, through the function of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Activate our creative power, the same creative power that Jesus manifested and the same creative power that Adam had at the moment of creation. Begin to activate that in us so that we can heal ourselves and we can maintain maintain our healing and walk in health and vitality and abundance and wisdom and uh, righteousness and forgiveness and total absolution of all ill will in our life, and we can go on to heal others. Thank you, Lord. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.